Chapter 16 regards infectious diseases that affect your skin. Pretty much for the rest of the semester, it's going to be a specific disease, what the symptoms are, um, how to treat it, how you get it, and we're kind of going system by system. What that means is all the chapters are pretty much the same, and they go by pretty quick because they're all the same as far as explanation goes. The skin and its defenses. Layers of the skin. You have two layers to your skin. The top, which is pretty much from where the scallop starts up, and the bottom, which is where the scallop starts down until you start seeing fat deposits down here. So you have the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is the outer layer of skin. It's composed of epithelial cells, basically cells that cover surface. That's epithelial. They're replaced every 25 to 45 days. They contain keratin. Now notice it's not with a C, it's with a K because it is a hard, almost plastic-like substance. Even though technically it's not, it's, it gives us strength to our skin cells. It basically allows us to have the ability to withstand damage and water penetration. If you've ever had a shrimp shell and you put water in it, it'll hold the water. Our keratin is kind of along the lines of that. It's not exactly proper to say that, but it gives us the ability to kind of have water bead on our skin. It's not just about the oil. Keratin also helps with that. And when we rub our skin, our keratin, it's actually protecting the under layers of the skin. So it doesn't let things get past it. That's kind of one of the points of the epidermis. The dermis is composed of connective tissue. Guess what that does? It connects things together. You're right. It's under the epidermis. It actually harbors a dense network containing nerves, blood vessels, immune cells, hair follicles, and oil or sebaceous glands. This is a lot more interesting than a stack of bricks, which is pretty much what the epidermis is. So what are the defenses of our skin? Well, we're constantly shedding cells. Most of the dust that you have in your house is actually skin cells. Antimicrobial peptides will also fight off bacteria. Sebum, which is secreted by our oil glands, has a low pH. And if you'll remember, changing the pH actually makes it so that it's not that hospitable for those bacteria. So sweat. Not only does it have a high pH, but it also has a high salt content. And if you think back, um, when we were talking about the salty um, Dead Sea that has a high salt concentration, it's very hard for regular bacteria to grow on that. It makes it a, an inhospitable environment, so you kind of get a double whammy. You're not only getting a low pH, but you're also getting saltiness, which again, it's, it's not a good way for them to grow. It's not a good environment. Lysozyme is in sweat, it's in tears, it's in saliva. It breaks down the cell wall, that peptidoglycan cell wall. So it it's almost like ripping your skin off. It's just not a good thing to have happen to a bacterial cell. Plus, we have the normal biota of the skin, which you can see here and here in the drawing where, again, I, I mentioned this in the last unit, your normal biota likes you. It wants you to just help them. So if anybody comes in and tries to take away from them, they'll fight them off. At least they'll try to. The types of rashes associated with skin diseases, maculopapular rash, vesicular rash, pustular rash, exanthium, and inanthium. So let's talk about maculopapular rash. It's going to be flat to slightly raised colored bumps. So you're not looking at lesions or open sores. It's just kind of a, a red color. It may be slightly raised, but like I said, it isn't something that's sticking up like hives. Vesicular rash is a rash with lesions. So we actually have sores and they contain fluid. Usually it's going to be a clear fluid. It's not gonna be pus unless there's an infection, but that clear fluid is primarily blood serum. Pustular rash. This is a rash that is going to have lesions, except instead of having clear fluid, now we do have pus within those lesions, within those sores 
or blisters. It's viscous, it's yellowish, and instead of it just being blood serum, now you have a mixture of things. You've got serum, tissue leukocytes, as well as microbes. So you've got a mixture of stuff. It isn't just the serum all by itself. Exanthium is a rash on the skin. Inanthium is a rash on the mucous membrane. So a rash inside your mouth for example, would be a, a rash on the mucous membranes. Important skin diseases include measles, rubella, impetigo, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, chicken pox that will turn into shingles as you get older, smallpox and ringworm. Now, I'm going to warn you, there are some pictures that are pretty bad as far as showing what this looks like on an actual person. I just wanna warn you, um, I'm hoping that if you're in micro, you, you are of a strong constitution, but in order for you to see what these things look like, I have pictures. Measles, as far as background information, it's also known as rubiola. Um, it is still an issue worldwide, but cases have decreased significantly since the advent of the vaccine. We are starting to see it kind of surge back because people aren't getting vaccinated, but yeah. The reservoir, so who holds it? Humans are the only ones that actually hold it and a person isn't contagious during the convalescence phase, but the transmission route is going to be an airborne um, transmission. Signs and symptoms. So what do you see if somebody has measles? Respiratory and general or like general symptoms, you've got a sore throat, you've got a dry cough. It's not really a wet <clears throat> where you can actually hear something there. It's just kind of a dry cough. They'll usually have a headache, they can have fever. As far as the skin symptoms go for this, since this is our skin chapter, you've got that red um, maculopapular rash. It begins usually on the head and it spreads to the trunk and then to the extremities. What causes it? Measles is a virus and it is a member of the genus Morbillivirus, okay? Um, the pathogenesis, so how does it work in the body? It attaches to the respiratory mucosa. We actually breathe this in and it infects the tracheal and the bronchial cells. So the trachea is your breathing tube, the bronchii are the ones that branch off to get into your lung tissue. It travels via the lymphatic system and the bloodstream eventually to the skin to become the rash that we kind of associate measles with. Treatment and prevention. Well, for treatment, it's one of those that you just kind of got to live through it, but with the symptoms, we can help treat those. So you can give fever reducers. So you can give things like baby aspirin to kind of help bring fever down or aspirin for adults. You can give cough suppressants since it's not really a cough that's productive, that's getting things out of the body. You can give them something to make them stop coughing. You can replace lost fluids and electrolytes, Pedialyte if they're at home, popsicles, things like that. No specific treatment is actually going to target the virus though. There isn't anything that's gonna make the virus go away. You just gotta live through it. Prevention, vaccine. The measles, mumps, rubella, MMR vaccine contains live attenuated or weakened measles virus and confers protection for up to 20 years. That's huge. It is actually a really effective vaccine. So again, how do you recognize measles? Their skin will develop this kind of rash. Like I said, it's raised sometimes, it's kind of flat, but it's red. The first symptom is a high fever. Next comes the runny nose, the cough, the red eyes. Finally, a rash of tiny red spots begins. Usually the head, like I said, travels to the torso and then eventually goes to the limbs. The disease is contagious though, well before the rash shows up. So you may not even know the kid has measles and they're spreading it. Complications. One of the most, I guess, detrimental complications is encephalitis. 
it's uh, infection in the brain. So you've got brain swelling, and if that does progress to brain swelling, you can have permanent damage like deafness in the child. Depending on how bad that swelling is, they can also be mentally impaired. For every thousand U.S. children who get measles, one or two is going to die from it. I realize that it, it may not seem like that's a big deal, but it's a big deal, especially when we have a vaccine that can prevent it from happening. This is actually the virus, the measles virus. And as I said, it invades through the well, through breathing it in, and then it'll affect the throat and the lungs. It is highly contagious and spreads through the air. Remember we talked about if I had measles and I was in a classroom with people, 15 people would get it. Rubella. Rubella is also known as the German measles or the three-day measles. As far as compared to the measles, it is relatively mild. It can cause complications to a fetus if a mother is infected. The mother should be vaccinated prior to conception in order to kind of minimize the harm to the fetus. Reservoir, again, it's only humans that carry this and it's respiratory as far as transmission goes. Signs and symptoms. Postnatal rubella in patients other than babies contracting rubella while in utero. You get pink maculopapular rashes beginning on the face, spreading down the trunk to the extremities. You can kind of see it's the same pattern as the measles, but it is a very quick resolution. It goes away pretty fast. And it is milder as far as symptomology than the measles are. Congenital rubella, prenatal, if it is occurring in the first trimester, it can actually result in miscarriage or even permanent birth defects, which is not great. If it occurs past that first trimester, the, I guess, most common symptom that they see is deafness. So what's the pathogen? Rubivirus is the pathogen. Pathogenesis. It is similar to measles. Like I said, it begins in the respiratory tract. You breathe it in, spreads to other parts of the body, including the skin from there. Treatment and prevention. There is no specific treatment for the virus. You can treat the symptoms of postnatal rubella, but there is no treatment for congenital. If you get it and you're pregnant, it, you just got to write it out. Prevention. The MMR vaccine. Again, as far as effectiveness, this is a very effective vaccine if you use it. So this is rubella. You can see that there are red spots, slightly raised, not really um, pustules involved. That's the actual virus over there in the corner. Congenital rubella. If you have an unimmunized pregnant woman that contracts rubella through the nose and the throat, they will give it to the baby. Once the fetus is exposed to the virus, the cells developing the eyes, the ears, the brain, and the central nervous system, as well as the heart, can be damaged. So in babies, what, what happens? What does it cause? You've got hypertension, high blood pressure, glaucoma, affecting the eyes, dental abnormalities, the teeth don't form correctly, deafness, cataracts, again, the eyes enlarged liver and spleen, mental retardation, and not only can you be deaf, but you can also become blind because like I said, the eyes and the ears both are kind of affected. Other complications include brain damage, cerebral palsy, even learning disabilities. 85% of the babies that are in utero during the first trimester, the mothers get rubella, are going to show some type of defect. So impetigo. Impetigo is a polymicrobial infection. It primarily occurs in children just because kids have a tendency not to wash their hands and to touch a lot of things. The reservoir is humans. The transmission route, direct contact um, with the person who has it or indirect com contact through fomites. Remember the blocks with the kids? 
Signs and symptoms, usually you're going to have localized lesions, usually around the mouth and around the face because that's kind of where they touch the most and it ends up looking very kind of crusty and flaky. As I said, it's polymicrobial most of the time, so pathogen, it's usually Staphylococcus aureus or, or a combination of the two. The bacteria will contact the skin. They'll multiply and release exotoxins and extracellular enzymes. That is actually what is causing damage to the host's skin. Treatment, topical antibiotics. You're going to get cream to put on top of this lesion-y rash. How do we prevent it? Good hygiene. Wash your hands. That's pretty much what you need to do. You need to wash your hands and try not to touch your face. So this is Streptococcus pyrogens. That's Staphylococcus aureus. And you can see how bad this infection is on this kid's face and this kid's face. Now admitted, they're slightly different, but can you imagine if you have a combo of these two things? Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. As far as the largest population affected by this, you're talking about newborns and babies. Humans are the reservoirs. The transmission route is direct contact, somebody touching the baby. The agent is transferred from adults to babies uh, or from a baby to a caregiver. If it's on the baby and they're taking care of the baby, it can also be transferred to adults. But again, the ones that are mostly affected are going to be newborns and babies. You get bullous lesions, basically that top layer, the epidermis of the skin will start to split. It almost looks like you've burned their skin. That's why they call it scalded because it looks like you've burned their skin and it's just sloughing off. It leads to widespread disquamation. The top layer is coming off. It's just sloughing off. It leads to separation of the epidermis, which appears as basically it looks like a burn. Staph aureus is responsible for this. The strain actually does have to produce exfoliative toxin A and B which usually comes from lysogeny with a fade. Remember I talked about they pick up certain things that can make them more pathogenic, more virulent. In this case, we have something that would normally cause impetigo picking up this extra phage uh, DNA and it picks up the extra genes, the exfoliative toxins A and B, and now it can do this. Treatment. Oh, sorry. Pathogenesis. The microbe comes into contact with the skin, the throat, or the eye, and then it enters the bloodstream to spread throughout the body. It doesn't just stay in the one spot. Treatment, you've got to give them systemic antibiotics. They've got to have some type of either IV antibiotics or they have to have some type of oral antibiotic that can go through their whole body. Prevention. Eliminate carriers of the agent as those in contact with neonates. If you know somebody carries this specific version of staph, um, staph aureus, you want to make sure that they never contact babies. They're never in touch with babies. Good hand washing practices between patients also is essential. Remember I said staphylococcus aureus, right? Here are two babies that have it. If you look, it looks like their skin blistered off. That's what happens. That's why they call it staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome because it really does look like they got burned. Now, did they? No. It's a bacterial infection, but it looks like it. I can't even imagine how painful this would be for them. Chicken pox, which can later develop into shingles. So chickenpox itself is an acute viral infection. It's a very short-lived viral infection, whereas shingles is actually a latent infection caused by that same virus. Chickenpox is kind of like herpes. Once you get it, you never get rid of it. It's always there. The thing is, it goes away. The symptoms go away. And then as we get older, 
usually in our 50s or 60s and our immune system doesn't work as well, we end up having a resurgence of it. It'll come back kind of like herpes on your lips. When you get really, really stressed out, you always get fever blisters, except in this case, the symptoms are very different. And I'll talk about it in just a second. The reservoir, humans only, it's just people. Transmission route is also airborne and we get it through our respiratory system. So chicken pox, we will have a fever, we will have a vesicular rash, with centripetal distri distribution, meaning that we have more of these vesicles in the center of our body than the extremities. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't go there, but it's usually more concentrated like in our torso or on our torso. They itch, we scratch, and they will usually progress to incrustation and then eventually they heal. The vesicles are contagious until they are crusted over. So if you have open sores or you've got the actual blisters, they're contagious. Shingles. So the virus itself actually hides in nerve cells along your spinal column. They hide there and they will reactivate. When they reactivate, it will be a painful vesicular rash. Generally, it has a linear distribution along the trunk. So you will have kind of lines of this rash across your trunk. Reactivation is attributed to things like stress, to age, and other factors that basically compromise the immune system. Ultimately, what reactivates it? hands down is for some reason your immune system stops working so well and it takes advantage. One of the biggest issues with shingles, because it is hibernating inside of nerve cells when it comes out, it damages those nerve cells. Any nerve that you damage is automatically going to be painful. So as an adult, getting shingles is extremely painful. So what causes it? Human, human herpes virus 3 causes this. It's also called varicella zoster virus. As far as the pathogenesis, it enters through your respiratory tract, it attaches to the respiratory mucosa, and the microbes then enter the bloodstream and circulate to reach the skin. That's where our symptoms show as the chickenpox, as a little um, vesicular rash. In shingles, the virus remains latent in the nerve ganglia along our spinal column, again, until it's reactivated. Treatment. There is no treatment for the virus. You can give them treatments basically to eliminate the discomfort from the rash. You can use like calamine lotion, but once you have it, you have it. There's nothing anybody can do. Again, it's a virus. Viruses don't really have a lot that they can do. Prevention. There is a vaccine containing live attenuated virus from chickenpox. It's been available since 1995. And there is a separate vaccine for shingles called Zostivax. That has been available since 2006. Now, shingles vaccine is pretty well known because they even advertise it on TV that it's available, so if you want to use it, you can. So there's the virus itself. Here's the vesicular rash where you have blisters, you kind of have papules where it's just a raised section of skin, and then once these rupture, you have an ulcer, an open sore, and you can kind of see the progression of this. Again, once it kind of crusts over, it's not necessarily going to be contagious anymore. But during all of this time where it's open and it's an ulcer and you've got blisters, you're contagious. With shingles, like I said, it's linear. It kind of goes in a line around your torso. So you've got this big swath of rash. It isn't just little pinpoints anymore. It's this huge piece of your skin that has rash. And as I said, it is extremely painful because it's damaging your nerve cells as it rises from them. Smallpox. This is a god awful disease. I'm not even gonna, I'm not exaggerating. This is an awful disease. It was once a major issue worldwide, but it's been eradicated due to very successful vaccination program. 
The last case of smallpox in the whole entire world occurred in 1979. Now the worry is primarily things like bioterrorism. If you have a grandmother or you know an older person, ask them to show you their smallpox vaccination. It looks like a flower on their arm. And it was real common for people to, to get that vaccine. It caused scarring, but you didn't get smallpox. Again, awful disease. You didn't want to get it. The problem is that once we eradicated it, we, we didn't need to have the vaccination anymore. It wasn't on the planet anymore. There are two places that have this. The CDC in Washington, D.C. is one of them. And there's basically the Russian CDC in Moscow that has a sample of it. And they're not supposed to do anything with it. Problem? If anybody were to get a hold of smallpox and spread it around now, pretty much no one has any type of immunity to it anymore because no one's been vaccinated in years probably two generations worth of people because my mother's generation was vaccinated. I was not. I don't have that scar because if I did, I'd show you. I'd be like, look, this is what it looks like. But I, I don't. So bioterrorism wise, that's very, very scary considering what the disease is. The rash begins as a macule, then it progresses to papular, vesicular, eventually becoming pustular, before eventually crusting over. Oftentimes, it's going to cause scarring, and it's not just a little bit of scarring, it is significant scarring. Lesions are centrifugal instead of on the torso. They kind of go out into your extremities more. There is a more dangerous form of the disease, Bariola major. It's associated with cases of toxemia and shock. It poisons your blood and then you go into shock and you die. So what causes it? The Bariola virus causes smallpox. Microbe enters your respiratory tract. It attaches to the respiratory mucosa. The microbes then enter the bloodstream and they will spread from there. The rash will begin in the mouth. And this is how fast it works. Within 24 hours, it's all over you. There is no treatment for this. The vaccine um, contains live vaccina virus, which is cowpox. We talked about this when we were talking about the cowpox with the uh, milkmaid. Yeah. Examples. This is the variola virus. These are people that have smallpox. This is a guy that got better. Look at the scarring. That's just awful. This is a person who's suffering from it. This is a kid who got better. So when I talk about scarring, this is scarring. And that's if it doesn't kill you through the toxemia kind of path or route that it can take. Ringworm. Ringworm is pretty much a really general term to describe mycoses caused by dermatophytes. Reservoir, where do we find these dermatophytes? Humans, animals, soil, they're everywhere. Transmission route is Direct or indirect contact with infected humans, infected animals, or soil containing the organism. Usually you see circular patches that occur um, in various parts of the body depending on where you touched when you were infected or when you picked it up. Tinea capitis is ringworm on your scalp. Tinea curious, I'm sorry, curis is ringworm on the groin. It can also be called jock itch. Tinea pedis is ringworm on the foot, athlete's foot. Tinea unguinium is ringworm of the nail. It actually causes white patches and thickening and distortion of distortion and darkening of the nail. 
So dermophytes, it includes 39 species in the genera Trichophyton, Microsporum, and Epidermophyton. Pathogenesis, how does it happen? The microbes will come into contact with the epidermis and they begin to invade from there. They actually digest the keratin, the thing that's supposed to be like a protective shield. They eat it. Treatment, antifungals. Ringworm is ultimately a fungal infection. So you've got antifungals. They include myconazole and terbinafine. Prevention, avoid contact with reservoirs. If you are touching a lot of things, wash your hands before you touch anything else and do the whole, I'm going to wash them for the whole alphabet thing. So these are examples of trichophyton, microsporum, and epidermophyton. You can see how it forms a ring-like rash on the skin. This is why we call it ringworm. Now, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> My mom always told me ringworm was a worm that was under your skin. It's not. It's a fungal infection, just so you know. But these are examples of tinea corporis, which is on your torso. You've got tinea pettis on your foot, tinea, tinea unguium, which is basically in the nail. And I'm sure people have seen, you know, athlete's foot where the nail is all thick like this. Tinea capitis. You can see the rings on the scalp um, and then tinea curis, which is around the groin area. You can see again those circular patterns. That's kind of a real big clue that that's what you have.